Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing yet another discovery of a kind of an exciting exoplanetary system with at least two terrestrial planets, not so different in terms of mass and size from planet Earth, orbiting it around a relatively intriguing star that we often refer to as an ultra-cool M-type star, one of the more intriguing objects when it comes to finding exoplanets. And a star that's extremely similar to the now iconic TRAPPIST-1 system that we've discussed a few years ago when it was originally discovered and created a lot of buzz because seven terrestrial planets were discovered in orbit around this star, with some of these planets having all of the necessary conditions to potentially host liquid water and maybe even being habitable. But now the scientists identified another really intriguing star system with very similar properties and with at least one of these planets also being in the habitable zone. With I guess one major difference being that instead of having seven terrestrial planets, now there are only two. But despite of this, this is still a really exciting star system because the star in this case is also very intriguing and in theory does provide necessary conditions for at least one of these planets to potentially become habitable. And so let's discuss exactly what the scientists found here. But I guess let's start with the somewhat unusual name. This particular star system is now referred to as Speculus 2, which when googled brings up this, a Belgian biscuit that's actually really popular in the US as well. And I was really confused about this because the previously discovered star system that a lot of scientists behind the study were responsible for, TRAPPIST-1, was named after a beer, a Belgian beer known as TRAPPIST. And so it turns out that a lot of Belgian scientists tend to name things after things they eat or drink. And then they give them a kind of a backronym. In case of TRAPPIST, it stands for Transiting Planets and Planetesimal Small Telescope, and Speculus is now known as Search for Habitable Planets Eclipsing Ultra Cold Stars. So that's actually pretty clever but beside the point. The main point behind this mission is to actually try to find various habitable planets or terrestrial planets orbiting what's known as ultra-cool dwarfs, which in this case refers to M-type stars or red dwarfs, but that actually have even lower temperatures than usual, less than 2700 Kelvin, or about 2500 Celsius, 4400 Fahrenheit. And there's a really important reason why the scientists are interested in these types of stars. Based on the accretion model of planetary formation, it's generally believed that most of these types of stars would usually have relatively low mass of the accretion disk, which would actually result in much smaller planets overall. Planets that are not going to be gas giants and ice giants, but planets that are actually going to be terrestrial, Earth-like or Mercury-like in size, and not planets that are going to be Jupiter-like. And so because smaller stars would result in smaller sized planets, in this case, the coldest of these M-type stars are probably going to result in some of the smallest terrestrial planets we can find. But more importantly, they would also have the longest lifespans, with the average being a few trillion years and some of the longest stars potentially living up to 12 trillion years in total. Remember, the age of the universe is 1000 times less, it's only about 13.8 billion years meaning that, in trillions of years, these are the only stars we're going to be seeing in the night skies. But this naturally also means that the planets that are going to be located in these systems will have the highest chance to potentially maintain the conditions they currently have for the longest possible time. And that of course means that if they're habitable now, they're going to remain habitable for a pretty long time. Which is exactly why the scientists started several different surveys whose main purpose was to try to look at as many of these ultra-cool dwarfs as possible in order to identify any shadows passing in front of them. Or in other words, in order to see if they can actually discover any transit planets. And in this case, they focused on at least a thousand known ultra-cool stars and several brown dwarfs. But in this case, it also involved the TRAPPIST telescopes and also the saint X Observatory located in Mexico. But because they only want to find planets in the habitable zone or as close to the habitable zone as possible, in this case, you only had to look at one of these stars for only approximately 10 days. For example, a typical year around the TRAPPIST-1 system is only a few days long, with an average being about 7 to 8 days for some of these habitable zone planets. And so within approximately 10 days of observation, it should be possible to detect any planet, if there is any, passing in front of a typical star. Although really, we're looking at these stars from this direction, because you're not going to be seeing shadows if it's this way, but you are going to be detecting transit planets if we are positioned in just the right orientation in regards to the planetary disk. So basically it has to be sideways. And on top of this, because these are much smaller stars in terms of size, any kind of a passage in front of them is going to have a much easier to see observation, or in other words, they're going to produce a much deeper transit, 
and so it's going to be much easier to find these and even much easier to analyze. And so detecting terrestrial planets around these M-type dwarfs has actually become a goal for a lot of different observatories. But there are also quite a lot of studies out there that argue against M-type stars being good for detecting habitable planets, with several reasons provided already, but there's maybe one major one. The reason here being that many planets in these star systems are very likely like nothing we have here in the solar system, they're known as the eyeball planets, very likely containing conditions we can't really even imagine, basically always facing the same side to their star, and very likely possessing only temperate conditions along the area known as the twilight zone. And that's maybe the only place where we can find liquid water. Nevertheless, for this mission to be successful in observing at least 500 different planets, it's going to need approximately 5 years in total, which means that it's going to be discovering quite a lot of these planets in the process. And because these planets are so easily visible and usually have a transit that's approximately 15 minutes in length, overall their identification can be done really quickly and very efficiently. And even figuring out other properties of these planets like their mass and their density is much easier around these types of stars because of the overall small size of these star systems and very accurate observations that become possible with a lot of modern telescopes. But more importantly, these objects are also perfect for various planetary atmospheric studies. Detecting the atmospheres around these planets and also seeing what's inside these atmospheres is much easier here as well and that's exactly why modern studies want to mostly focus on these planets because seeing what's happening here is just way way easier and way quicker. And so now we have two more objects that this can be done with, located about 104 light years away from us. The official name for the star system is LP 890-9 and it definitely possesses two super Earths or terrestrial planets slightly more massive than planet Earth. One of them is about 30% larger than Earth and has an orbit of 2.7 days, which actually puts it somewhere on the hotter end of the spectrum. In this case, it's probably a lot more similar to Venus, but the second planet is a lot more exciting. An orbit here is about 8.5 days and is basically within the so-called habitable zone. But intriguingly, it actually gets a little bit less starlight than planet Earth, which in theory means that it could be a little bit cooler. But in this case, it actually really all depends on the atmosphere present on the planet and the overall greenhouse effect as well. If there is an atmosphere here, and if it's a little bit thicker than planet Earth, in theory it can be just as warm as planet Earth itself. But because it's very likely tidally locked and is always facing same way toward its star, the actual conditions here are going to be very difficult to predict. But because this is one of two planets discovered so far and because it's so easily visible, it's one of two perfect targets for the upcoming observations from James Webb Space Telescope. In this case, observing these planets can actually teach us quite a lot about what happens in these red dwarf systems and also teach us more about exoplanetary atmospheres. And at the moment, the planets in this star system and also TRAPPIST-1 system are the only two star systems known to us that definitively have terrestrial planets where atmosphere can be detected very easily. And intriguingly enough, it's also the second coolest star in terms of temperature discovered to possess terrestrial planets. The first one is obviously TRAPPIST-1. As a matter of fact, when it comes to the strength of the signal or how easily visible this is, only TRAPPIST-1 planets create a better opportunity or are better targets. In this case, the Speculus-2 system is the second best we have so far. And by comparing and contrasting these two systems, it can also create a perfect opportunity to figure out the habitability conditions around these star systems and to also figure out how different or how similar some of these planets are around various M-type stars. Or I guess, in other words, figure out if any of these planets can even be habitable to begin with. And that's of course a pretty important question because in the last few years a lot of studies started to discover quite a lot of negative things about M-type stars. They seem to be a lot more active, they seem to produce a lot of X-rays and UV radiation, and they also seem to flare up quite a lot. And if these flares can be responsible for stripping everything from the surface of these planets, it would once and for all prove to us that essentially only G-type stars or stars similar to our sun can maybe host terrestrial planets with habitable conditions. And so figuring out if M-type stars are as hostile as they look and if they can permanently remove habitability of any planet located in the system is something a lot of future studies want to tackle using observations from the James Webb. And since M-type stars are also the most common stars in the galaxy, it is a pretty big question to answer. Are we going to be finding a lot of terrestrial planets with habitable conditions pretty much everywhere around us? 
Or are all these planets just barren rock with nothing on the surface? With the only possibility of habitable conditions existing around G-type stars like our Sun, which are actually kinda rare. And though this star that's about 7 billion years old may be potentially calm compared to some of its partners, only further observations and further studies can definitively tell us what's going on here. For now we can only wait for some of the future observations by the James Webb or some of the future discoveries from the Speculus telescope that's going to be collecting more data from approximately a thousand different stars. And until I discover some other star system that has even more planets or more exciting planets, that's pretty much it. Check out some of the previous videos on exoplanets and their discoveries in the description below. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.